Good morning, and welcome to Issues That Matter. And today we have a show on which probably is not as much of an issue today as it will be off into the future uh, due to a time lag and the way that things impact Maine a few years after it impacts some of the more major metropolitan areas of the country. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about post-traumatic stress syndrome uh, and how it impacts police officers. And to discuss that today, I have Deputy Chief of the Gorham Police Department, Chris Sanborn. Deputy Chief, welcome. Thank you, Bob. And we also have John, correct me if I get the pronunciation <laughs> correct, wrong, John Lizanik yes. of the York Police Department uh, to talk about, again, PTSD. And I'm, I'm honored and very pleased to have, once again, as a co-host, Jessica Liberty, Good to be here. Who has, who has a background in PTSD only because her father was a, a lifelong deputy, uh, not deputy chief, chief mm -hmm. of the Waterville Police Department. Yep, 27 I, years almost on the department. Well, that, that gives you a background, not only the, a background on PTSD, but a background on the impact on the family mm -hmm. of PTSD, which, is a, which I, I'm sure is going to be a major part of the show today. So, Jessica? Take it away. Excellent. Thank you. This is a very important issue and something that legislature spotlighted last session. There was a bill in LD 848, which now makes post-traumatic stress disorder um, covered under workers' compensation law. Right. It's an issue that has existed for a long time, but it's it now it's more open that it's being discussed. And I know that in Cumberland County, there have been a number of of initiatives that have been undertaken by law enforcement to address the mental health of your officers. So could you tell us a little bit more about the program that Gorham has done and that York is a counterpart on? Sure can. Um, so uh, about a year or so ago, I took over as the training coordinator for uh, Cumberland County. And one of the uh, topics that I decided to try to address uh, through my position was this specific issue of uh, uh, PTSD um, and trying to get out in front of it and what we could do to, to manage uh, the issue that was going on uh, in the public safety community in general. Um, so I reached out to a gentleman by the name of Paul Panette, uh, Maine Psychological uh, Trauma Institute uh, based out of Saco. Um, and uh, we worked together along with uh, uh, the captain from York Police Department um, to organize a training uh, back this past April uh, to get about 34 law enforcement officers and dispatchers trained in what's called post-traumatic stress management, um, which is based off the SISM model. Um, and we have established uh, what we're calling the Southern Maine uh, Post-Traumatic Stress Management Team. Uh, we're available 24-7 to provide uh, support services, um, whether it's a one-on-one peer-to-peer support or whether it's, uh, you know, for what we call coping groups, um, but what other folks might realize, uh, uh, call uh, debriefings. Talk to me a little bit. There's a step, actually, now that they recommend before a debriefing. So for folks who don't know, if there's a critical incident, an, a fatal accident investigation, a child's death, those might be the type of cases that would trigger a debriefing for, for staff, Sergeant? Correct. And, and the key thing is right away you need to get on it. Um, that zero to 72 hour mark is a stabilization group. And a lot of it we deal with, unfortunately, almost, uh, almost daily on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but not with the bigger cases. We do get those calls. And those stabilization groups are so important for us to get in there and say, you're dealing with a abnormal situation. It's normal to feel the way you are. How is your body gonna react to that? And then how are you gonna react to your surroundings um, and to how people view you? So unfortunately in police work, we, we tend to put up a guard. Mm -hmm. and, and you, you have to be the tough person and you can't let your feelings show. Um, but we've both been in this for a long time and you, in our group, we, we try to convey the message that it's okay and how are we gonna deal with that issue from here on in. But that zero to 72 hours is very important to jump into that. Is part of that new protocol that if there is somebody that after, after a critical incident, um, I think 
back this fall, there was a case in Scarborough where a five-year-old mm -hmm. was killed with her father's handgun. And Scarborough put together, they, they reached out, and that first 24 hours, if somebody does not have someone to go home to, you hold them over? Y yeah, so uh, in that time frame, it's very important for administrators, supervisors, and other officers to kind of check in with those employees, as, as John mentioned, um, to see how they're doing. Talk to them a little bit about the incidents that they've been involved in, what they, you know, uh, should be doing. Do they have support services available at home? Um, folks that they can kind of talk to um, and uh, find some comfort at home. Um, and if they, if they don't, um, then we're there to kind of point them in the direction to, to provide that support. Law enforcement, public safety in general, we're one big family and we take care of each other. Um, so uh, that's kind of what this group is all about as well. And the nice thing with those cases, like with Scarborough, uh, most of us have chaplains. Uh, we have our church services, social services. So. Sometimes the officers or emergency personnel may not want to talk mm. to their immediate peers. Um, most of those cases, we bring in one of those chaplains during the call. So they're there to deal with the family, but also the officers or the emergency personnel. So that's a nice touch. And while we're doing our job, unfortunately, as supervisors, they can actually handle that part and, and tell us what we need to do next. And then we can look to people like Paul. They, um, for further help or counseling later on. Um, but that initial step of having a chaplain or social services, a church group, or even a friend of the family come sit with them. And um, we have a certain list we go down through of what your reactions are gonna be in certain situations and how your body will react and sleeping patterns, eating patterns, things like that. But um, we do have those social services um, resources that we can grab onto which like I said, on those bigger calls, we get them there immediately cause, because they're so important. I, I, I do have to confess that I've, I wasn't born yesterday, <laughs> a lot of yesterdays ago, <laughs> but, I, but I do have to confess that I, I never really considered the impact of a, of a horrific event that takes place. I never really considered the impact that it has on the police officer that's responding to it. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, and oftentimes, you know, over the course of a career, you know, these incidents tend to build up and, you know, the officers or public safety members don't even realize that that's happening. Um, and it may not be the most traumatic incident that you responded to that starts to trigger some of these concerns or issues that are going on. It yeah. may be something that you might think would be insignificant um, over the course of a career, um, but it, that's when things start festering up. And that's why... You're right. right. And the, the thing is, too, and I think with this group, we've, we've come to realize how much this has grown, that it's not, as officers, we have, to job, we have a job to do. So you tend to put things aside. And um, as the chief said, that builds up over time. But also with our dispatchers, emergency services personnel, um, and then our families beyond that. When I go home after a bad incident, how do I react to them and how do I treat them? So um, this group and our talks and our training with Paul, we've really opened it up quite a bit where we've offered even the spouses some training, um, some coping mechanisms on how to deal with us when we come home and then also deal with their stress. So it doesn't affect the kids and the families. You just mentioned something that I, I suspect Jessica will be talking about it as, as we move on here. And that's the impact on the family, the police officer's family. Huge. The stress put on the police officer's family, which I suspect is largely overlooked. I think, uh, too, I have a longtime friend. He's a sergeant in another department. And he said it's just the stress of that two-ounce badge in today's world. You are a target by virtue of your badge. Right. And there's a mental stress that goes along with that. So I imagine these, these critical incident teams that you have in place are able to kind of buffer some of that. They definitely are. And I mean, that, that, that's one thing I don't think people from the outside realize is that you're a police officer 24 seven. I'm sure you saw it with your, your father as a chief. Um, my kids are still young, but my, my oldest are going to be 12, but they see that too. 
and we live in town, so they we, they live in the town that I work. So when we go out to the grocery store, we still see people that have arrested, and they come up, and we've been fortunate, knock on wood, but it does. It does have an impact. It sure does. Or incidents that I've dealt with at work can come up in their school atmosphere, so they get brought up in discussions in school. So those are things that you need to really talk about and look at with your kids, and it's all age relevant, but. And something that you said, Deputy Chief, it may not be one call, but in law enforcement, um, cumulative post-traumatic stress disorder is, is very prevalent. I think we're all familiar with the figure every 53 hours a law enforcement officer is lost in the line of duty. But what folks don't realize, the number one killer of law enforcement is at their own hands. That's right, unfortunately. And that's what getting ahead of these issues is really what you're trying to prevent. Right, right. We're looking to try to, uh, as you said, kind of get out in front of, uh, kind of get out in front of these sorts of uh, concerns and issues, and kind of educate the officers on uh, signs and symptoms that they need to be looking for, um, that they might be experiencing, ways that they can take care of themselves. Officer wellness is huge. Um, we, as uh, a profession, have been fantastic about talking about officer safety, taking care of ourselves, talking about uh, you know physical fitness and that sort of thing being important in our profession. Um, um, but all too often we don't talk about our emotions and you know our mental well-being as well and uh, that's kind of why we're where we're at today it's time for us to be talking about those sorts of things and kind of putting the things into place to help other officers do that in, in, and with our last training with paul we actually added in the supervisors um, section of that so the supervisor the first really the first ones are co-workers to yeah. see these issues coming up um, and they can bring those concerns to us and hopefully get people help before it gets to that point. Yeah, that training was specifically geared to kind of identify the red flags um, for the supervisors to kind of be looking out for, um, for maybe some concerns that they might see that need to be brought to our attention so that we can reach out to those officers um, and sit down and have conversations with them and um, check in with them and make sure that everything's going well and to provide the resources if need be um, for them. Excellent. What are, um, and you said that you include dispatchers. That was one of the, the criticisms of the law that was enacted here in Maine that took effect a month ago today, November 1st. Dispatchers were excluded from that, but they are that first line. They're oftentimes the one who has that, for, they are the ones who have that first contact with a victim. Um, so it's, it's wonderful that you're including and encapsulating them in those support services. And we, we actually trained dispatchers in our last, um, we had them attend some of the training. But you're right, those living in that box, mm. they don't get to go to the call. They take the initial screams and cries on the phone call, and then the phone rings again, and it's somebody else. So they're on to the next call. Um, and a lot of the times, too, we go back and we have our debriefings as, as an overall incident as to what happened, safety issues. Dispatch may not be included in that, so sometimes they're left out of the loop and they don't know what happened. They don't know the end result. Um, and I've spent a lot of time with the dispatchers. I just went to the training and I never realized it either, how much the, they're impacted by it. They've, they have a very tough job. At least we get to go there and, I mean, we see it, see it through as to what happened. They get the initial snippet and then a lot of times That's they it, don't. they cut right, out of the yeah. process. Right. And they're and on to the next call and they don't know what happened. And all too often they're forgotten. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important that we did include them in this training and in, in, you know, including them in our, in our debriefings. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about those debriefings because is there follow up after that first 72 hours? It may not hit somebody. It may be another call that then triggers those emotions from a call that they may have taken that you had the debriefing on. What kind of follow-up is there weeks and months down the road? Do you want to answer that? Sure. So all, you know, basically the procedure is initially after the, you know, these types of incidents or just ongoing in general, that's why we, you know, train the supervisors. Um, we're doing one-on-one -on -one check-ins with these officers, um, making sure that, you know, they're doing okay after these types of incidents. Um, and then, uh, you know, if need be, after a major critical incident, um, we're setting up uh, what we call a stabilization group, which is really just another larger scale of 
that one-on-one -on -one check in um, and uh, you know then the coping the coping group is uh, basically established for the larger critical incidents very nice and so all agencies in Cumberland County are part of this so if there were a critical incident anywhere within the county and and your county and basically what we've done is split it up with um, the training council so district one mm -hmm. I'm the rep for this side of it, um, and then uh, District 2, uh, the chief has. So if anything happens, they can call us 24-7, and we'll try to put together a team either, either immediately or within that 72 hours that we can meet. Um, and a lot of them have been that one-on-one -on -one talks, or we've had some with 15, 20 people with the coping groups. And they're, it's amazing how well um, how those go because people really open up. I have to believe that there's probably so few people out there that understand all of these happenings, all of these goings on. Uh, they, they don't have a clue. Unless you're, you're an immediate family member, a lot of times it's you don't understand. Sort of kept inside, yeah, and you don't, you don't understand because you don't see that stress, that impact. Um, I'm fortunate enough that my wife was a police officer, so she gets it, and I still have my de-stressing time to go work out or take my yeah. time to myself. And that's important, isn't it? Very important, and that's one of my coping mechanisms. So, um, yeah, a lot of people don't see that. And you know, like I said, though, with these groups, once you see it, people are a little uncomfortable the first five, ten minutes, and then they just open it up, and it's amazing what comes out of this. And then the relationships you build afterwards and the follow-up afterwards, we usually give it a week, a couple days, and then a week we'll, we'll make another phone call to see if anybody needs a follow-up or needs to see anybody else. Um, employee assistance is always there, so we can use that. But the, the connections you make in that, you make some good friendships too. They can talk informally afterwards. Um, so, um, and I know the chief has probably had the same these groups help us too, absolutely. Because we, we we deal with these incidents all well, the time Well, your officers, too. you've you've been on the street, right, and know what it's right. like to experience these sorts of things, right. Um, so it's kind of nice to be able to give back. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you think it, there's a comfort level in that it's peers doing this because police are suspicious, um, very guarded. Your circle tends to be the blue circle, right. um, you develop that sixth sense of humor as a, as a coping mechanism, but when the mm -hmm. support is being provided by peers, does it take away some of that skepticism of opening up and, and participating in something of this sort? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it def definitely makes it much easier for people to feel comfortable talking um, to someone that's in the profession, understands the work, Mm -hmm. um, and knows what they're going through and what they're experiencing, no question about it. And understands those, those jokes and the way you deal with it to get through a bad incident. And, um, and where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right, where somebody uh, what, outside what, I'm may so not. sorry if, I, if no, I'm that's interrupting. Okay. But what's running, what's bouncing around in my mind is I'm, I'm thinking about television shows and they always have internal affairs. And I'm thinking, my question I guess is, when you have the interaction from officer to officer, it's not necessarily an officer in internal affairs, internal affairs and somebody who's a uh, beat officer. Uh, it's another beat officer is having a contact or the beat, or the beat officer's supervisor. So, so these, these, these sessions that we're involved in are completely confidential, completely separate from uh, you know, a, cr a critical uh, incident uh, debriefing uh, is completely separate from uh, an internal affairs investigation or kind of overseeing uh, a specific incident and looking into you know what happened. Um, everything that's said in these sessions are confidential. Do not leave the room um, and uh, unless there's some sort of red flag that's raised that needs to be addressed um, and then that's passed on to the administrators of the agency to deal with. Um, but everything's confidential in that room. And, and that's, a, that's an important part, too, is it's not an after-action um, like review. A review mm -hmm. where we're yeah. not going over things you may have done wrong. We're just there to help you. And um, the confidentiality piece is huge, especially, like I said, with they police officers. They won't come if they think that's they right. won't. 
That's right. And we've had that happen. Yes. We've had people say, I'm not coming. And, and that was one of the criticisms of the law, um, the proposed change to the workers' comp, that then, oh, it'll be used against me. If I mm -hmm. take part in this, it's going to be held against me for promotion. I'm going to be seen as weak. So then folks won't come forward to seek the help that they need. In my opinion, you're stronger. You're stepping up and saying, hey, I need some help. Mm -hmm. I'm having a tough time with this. And you're doing something about it. Absolutely. And making, making sure that you're well. Mm -hmm. And preventing another tragedy. Right. Because unfortunately, no matter how you tried, how much you tried to hide it, it's going to come out in some way, shape, or form. It will come out. Um, and we're human. We're people mm -hmm. first before we're police officers. Mm -hmm. So. And I would imagine too, with the opioid crisis that we have going on, those types of calls must wear, wear they on do, you. They do, especially when they're um, younger, when you have children and you start seeing these. And, uh, you know, we live in smaller communities, so you know the families. Um, one of the people I've dealt with several, nine times, we've Narcaned his son. I mean, uh, and uh, he doesn't know what to do. And he's just at wit's end, and I've known him for 22 years. Wow. And what do you do? Of course that impacts you, too. And that's the next time you go to a call, I'm sure that that's always in the, that's right. in the back of your mind. That's right. And our officers are getting younger mm -hmm. because we are on that workforce cusp that, you know, they come in and many of them have military experience. That's, mm -hmm. So they have some of their own things that they've witnessed right. and seen. What, if, what can the academy do? I know that mental health is a small portion. Do you think that the curriculum at the Criminal Justice Academy needs to to include more work on the mental health and wellness of officers so that they're prepared at the front end of their career? I, I think they're doing a great job up there. Um, of course, every aspect of the academy should be tenfold. Mm -hmm. Every aspect, every class is so important. Um, one thing I do like what they're doing, I, I teach up every, every class, but they bring in the families for their family day. And it's a big portion of that is how the families, how their officer or their family member is going to change and what they're going to see at home. So they spend the day at the academy and they see what the police officer went through for that eight, those 18 weeks, but also they talk about these issues when they come home. So I like that. They've added that. That wasn't there when we went. No. Um, so they have a full day right before Thanksgiving that the family comes in. And they actually sit down with the families, they talk with the chaplain and um, all the issues that can come up with police work. That's a huge component because mm -hmm. that's their immediate support system. Mm -hmm. Right. So have you had a lot of requests to go to other parts of the state to start training other staff? So uh, kind of the nice thing uh, that's occurred out of this is it is starting to spread to other parts of the state. Um, NAMI, Maine mm -hmm. uh, has actually received some grant funding um, and there's a training that's coming up uh, in December, I believe it's the 13th and 15th, uh, to train officers uh, in PTSM uh, in the central part of the state and the northern end of the state. Uh, they also, uh, through this grant funding, uh, have selected a core group of counselors um, that are familiar with our profession. Um, and they've gone through a week, uh, rather a weekend long uh, training uh, as far as how to work with us and understanding our profession and uh, providing counseling services for us. So that's a resource for us uh, if we get to the point um, where we feel that we've got an, an employee or a person that needs to uh, receive some counseling. That's excellent. Do we have a lot of, of trained medical staff in dealing with, because from what I've read on PTSD and first responders, it's different than in the military or in the general population. Um, do we have the staff and resources here in Maine or are we looking at when somebody needs some maybe advanced help that we have to look at programs outside of our state? It's getting better in Maine. And I think with people like Paul Panett is really opening eyes. Um, and then these trainings, it sort of spreads. I mean, the last training we went to, there were quite a few of, you know, dispatchers or even um, counselors, chaplains involved. Um, it is getting better, but of course we always need more. Mm -hmm. Is it and a matter I, of funding? It is a matter it of is. funding. 
It is. No question about it. I mean, this started out, fortunately, you know, uh, we had the resources through our uh, district training councils to help mm -hmm. with scholarships for agencies and whatnot to send folks to this training. And now the grant funding that NAMI received is helping, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, spreading the training to other areas within the state. Um, but yeah, funding is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Are there grants available? There's always a way to work it out. And that we've been lucky with the districts. Um, you know, if they need to sponsor people, we'll get people in there. And we've been lucky too with Paul Panette, I mean, with his keeping his prices down <coughs> and the way he's done it, but also he, his volunteer work with this. And unfortunately that wears thin eventually. With, that's why we need more people. That's, but um, we've been very fortunate. We'll work whichever way we can get people involved in the training. And so NAMI has an event coming up in December. There's a Facebook group that started after the public hearing last winter, last March, actually. And that has grown. And the number of folks that have reached out and have sought resources available. So it, it's showing that the dialogue is happening because years ago, it was very taboo. I actually had a, a friend who's in law enforcement for over 30 years. And he said, what do you think about somebody who's been on the job for 30 years and has never gone to a critical debriefing? That's a bad thing. And that mm -hmm. was what I, I said. It's there's no investment in the officer. Your health and well-being right. has but been forgotten. Unfortunately, that's the way it was for years. And again, that's why when I took over as the training council coordinator for Cumberland County, that's I, you know, I've been in the profession for 28 years. I've you know seen these sorts of things going on in, in my career, and uh, that's why I felt that it was so important to get this team up and running. And uh, fortunately. Uh, York Police Department is a very progressive agency as well and uh, stepped on board and um, it's kind of taken off from this from this point. It really has and the nice thing too if if people don't feel comfortable in my area talking to someone they may work with we switch off and I could send them up to the chief. And it's all about trust. Vice versa. It, is, it is. It is. It and, is. Um, for years we had the critical incident stress management team that I was involved with um, but unfortunately it it's the same thing with volunteer work and people giving their time. You just, yeah, it wears thin. So um, they did a great job out of Southern Maine EMS for running that. Um, but the nice thing, I have the backing from my chief. I know you do too. Whatever you need, they're going to send us. I mean, and, and one of the last debriefings, how many, we had like four officers go. You had a couple officers. I mean, you just... We had six of us show up. Yeah, and it's amazing. And that was last minute. That was in one day they called and Chief said, take them off the schedule, go ahead and do it. Wow. That's just the I backing would, there is huge. I would venture to say that that is something that the largest, largest segment of the population has no clue about. No idea about goings on like that that take place on a routine basis mm -hmm. uh, when you're involved in it as a police officer. Mm -hmm. But the general public, not a clue. And it, it's, it's not their fault. It's just the way that life has been for so many years. Right, right. right. This and is and I would say television <coughs> has a certain uh, framework that they think, oh, this happens every place. Mm -hmm. No, it's not like that. Right. And unfortunately, in Maine, and you know, we, people look at Maine and say, nothing happens here. It's so quiet. But you know, on these bigger incidents, we show up with two or three people, not 10 people. So we're doing a lot more. A lot more is ex really expected from us. Um, that's where those extra resources, like the chaplains and even the um, church social services, and those people can really help out. But we still deal with those issues. It may not be as much or as, uh, as frequent. Yeah, as frequent. But. Um, we have to deal with it. We don't have the numbers as the bigger cities. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, before before the show, about a conversation that I had with a, a police officer up in Portland. Uh, back, this goes back over 20 years now, and he meant she made comment that what you see in Boston today will be in Portland in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Is that still a reality, or has has that time frame shifted? A little bit. It's probably more. It's, it's more of less than ten years. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I would say so. I mean, who would have thought we would have been dealing with the opioid crisis like what we're dealing with right now? And it's, it's you know, 
uh, a major factor. I'm, in, I'm, ple uh, I'm pleased to say that we had a show on the opioid crisis. Yeah, fantastic. We had from uh, Biddeford and a and counselor from Biddeford to talk about opioids. And that, that's, now it's getting national attention because of the White House is involved, right. which is very good. But they're on the front lines, and I think that's probably, you have the front row seat to the worst that society has to mm -hmm. offer by virtue of your job. I, I think something that really struck me, I had the opportunity recently to attend Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. And if you haven't gone, if you have an opportunity to see him, he's fabulous. But he spoke about how sometimes the greatest love is to live a life of sacrifice and how fitting for law enforcement because you are sacrificing, you're sacrificing your time and your safety, but all of those things that you see in the course of your career, it's at the sacrifice of your mental health and well-being. Absolutely, it's, it's really one of the best and the worst jobs in the world. I mean, we're very lucky in our communities, but you're right, I mean, it's some of those things you do, you, it takes a chunk out of you. It does, and it is very rewarding. You know, most of us get in this for the right reasons and we're here because we wanna, you know, help folks and, uh, you know, uh, make, a, make a difference in, in society. Um, but uh, it does take a toll uh, on us as, as people over the course of time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it's so important for well, us. That's the heart sure behind the badge, which mm -hmm. I think for a number of years, the badge has been dehumanized. And now we're starting yes. to see that tide turn a little bit. Yes, um, we're, we're people too. And I, I mean, like I said, we're lucky in the communities we live in. And we're not, maybe we don't have to deal with the shootings and the, uh, the bad, the stabbings, things like that, but we still deal with the bad car accidents and the, the fires that kill family members and or sex abuse cases. That's right. And that's right. And all those take a toll. And that's 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 the whole purpose of this group. That even the the minute the the little call that we may not bother me, could bother the chief or bother the dispatcher or the patrolman that shows up. So we all have a story. Well, everybody's unique in the way in which they respond to something. Mm -hmm. Last winter, there was a young boy who was mauled by a pit bull up in Corinna. And Sheriff Morton said to me, it wasn't the wound that got to him, it was how dirty the young the little boy was, to think that he lived in squalor like that. Yes. That's what he couldn't get over, not the trauma of the injury that took his life. So everybody responds differently. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would imagine, too, um, detectives that are doing sex abuse crime cases, something like this becomes of critical importance to them. It really does. And, and that's, again, that's really the supervisor's job, or the co-workers, too. They may see it more often, but by educating them that, please tell us, we're not looking to get anybody in trouble, and it's all confidential, we're just trying to get people help. Um, but you're right, some of those cases, um, uh, they're horrible, horrible, especially when you talk about children and the innocent people that uh, some of those things are just terrible. Mm -hmm. They are. And as a case like that might go to trial, would that be a time that maybe it might start to surface some, some issues that have, might, they might resurface to the, to the surface? A absolutely. Um, and that's why it's so important. Again, uh, one of the things that we did for the supervisors to kind of keep an eye on what's going on with the detectives and the officers and whatnot that are involved in that sort of uh, case to check in on them. Um, and if there are concerns, um, to bring it to our attention so that we can sit down with them and talk to them about that. And our agency, actually one of the folks that attended a training uh, is one of our detectives, um, just for that reason. So mm -hmm. that's excellent. And state police have new po have policies in place at twice a year. Folks in the computer crimes task force and in CID, they they have to go. Colonel Williams has said, I don't care if you go in and you complain the whole time that I've sent you here, but it's something that they are making officers go and participate in. So we we now start to see that shift in mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and it may not be even the trial. And this came up recently in my department. Just the discussions about the training, people started opening up about things that happened 10 years ago. And the, the little triggers that can set you off, just something you might see a, a little boy that, that looked like the victim or um, just something, a red car can trigger mm -hmm. something. I suspect it's safe to say that those little triggers that might set you off, until they set you off, 
the person didn't even know they existed. That's right. No. That's right. Absolutely. And, and that's where those coworkers or us can really try to try to see that and help out as much as we can. Are there plans in place that if if there might be a trigger for an officer who has been involved in a particular type of case, responding to future calls to prevent a trigger incident. Are there plans in place to address those sort of things? Uh, what we've done is, as, as supervisors, we try to be <laughs> cognizant of that. Um, if we have calls come up that we know that a person has dealt with in bad situations, I'll send somebody else or we actually go with them and we'll have them take a um, a secondary position with that call so somebody else will handle it and then we also you know with some people we have a chat with them right after the call or we talk to them are you okay with doing this do you want somebody else to it, it it's really a daily a daily thing we deal with most of it's one-on-one -on -one. these these coping mechanisms that we deal with with people having issues but yeah I mean we we have to keep an eye on that so if other agencies are watching and they want information, they can contact the two of you? Yes. Yeah. I'm, again, I'm the point person for uh, Cumberland County, so I can be reached uh, through the Cumberland County Regional uh, Dispatch Center. Um, so or mine is right through the York Police Department. And um, again, it's 24-7. We'll do whatever we can to help you out. And um, like I said before, the last one we had, People drop everything they, they do, they're doing to help each other out. So we'll get there. I, I, I think that, again, is another aspect that I would venture to say most people haven't a clue mm. about the commitment that officers make, not only, not only to the communities, but to their fellow officers, mm -hmm. irrespective of what department they're serving in. They very readily cross town lines mm -hmm. uh, in order to help each other out. And that, that's, something, that's something to be admired, respected, and do, do everything we can to encourage it. Uh, and I want to thank the two of you for appearing on the show today. Well, thank uh, you. you. Thank you I, for you giving us the opportunity. You represented your, the cause very, very well. <laughs> thank you for your service and your sacrifices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. And I, I am not a fan of one and done. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't want to say walk off the set today and say that was a good show, we're done with it, let's move on. Mm -hmm. No, that is not the way I like to function. All too often that is the way we end up functioning, but that's not the way I want to function. Uh, I, want, I want you folks to stay in touch, keep, us, keep me informed, keep us informed, and anytime you think we can be of service to do something, Give me the opportunity to say no. <laughs> That's a backhanded way of saying please ask. Fantastic. That sounds like a plan. Uh, so I, I want to I make sure that that, dig, that digs deep. Will do. Because I, I, I mean it sincerely. Thank you. Uh, I'm, not just, I'm not just spouting my mouth off, although sometimes people think I'm spouting my mouth off. <laughs> now, don't give any wisecracks, Jessica. I'm I being good. I got the right that time, didn't I? I'm being good. <laughs> yes, you are. But thank you very much for, for being on the show today. Oh, uh, I think it was a very informative show. You packed with a lot of good information that people need to be aware of. Jessica, you did a fine job. Thank you. And I look forward to having you uh, being a, a co-host again. Excellent. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, that's good. Then we're on the same wave wavelength. <laughs>